Wesley Neely lived in the West End of Newcastle with his mum Liz and younger brother Robert. He was a loving, loving child. He would help anybody. A funny, happy, go lucky little lad. Everybody used to say he had puppy dog's eyes and a smile that nobody could forget. My dad used to watch Wesley when I went to work and they had a very close bond. I used to love taking them out and here, there and everywhere and we, we had some great times and he was a bit of a little character and I loved I just loved him that much. Wesley was a sociable boy and in 1998, aged 11, amongst his passions were football and riding his bike. But in May of that year, Mum Liz felt it necessary to ground Wesley after he'd been approached by a stranger who asked him to help fix his car. When Wesley, you know nothing about cars, I went, this person's a stranger. I said, I don't know who this person is. I, I don't want you talking to people like that. And I had a funny feeling. Isn't something not right? And that's when alarm bells started ringing with me. Unsure who this man was, Liz kept Wesley in for a fortnight, by which point he was desperate to play out once again. Please, please, ma'am, can I go out on me bike? I'll stay in the street, I'll not move out the street. You can keep coming looking out the window. I went, right, fair enough. I said, so you learnt your lesson. He says, not to talk to strangers. And he was playing in the street every time I went to the window. The next day, Wesley, who suffered from epilepsy, was sent home from school after falling ill. I settled him down and he started coming round properly. And he went, what am I doing here, ma'am? And I said, well, I couldn't get you from school. Can you not remember? He went, no, ma'am. And he went, what time have I got to go for Robert for nursery? Went half past three. What time is it? I said, it's nearly two o'clock. Can I have 50 pence, ma'am? I went, what for? He said, I'll just go to the shop. I'll get some sweets for me and Robert. And off he went to the shop. Wesley's outing should only have taken a matter of minutes, but over an hour later, he hadn't returned. Thought, where the hell is he? And I seen like some of the other children waiting outside. And you seen Wesley on his bike? No. I went, are you sure? No, I haven't seen him. After returning home from nursery with her younger son, there was still no sign of Wesley. The time got on. And I'm backwards and forwards, look out the front, no sign of him. Wes, he couldn't tell the time, but he knew what time his medication was. It was about half past four, five o'clock, where I used to give him his medication for his epilepsy. And I thought, well, he'd be in shortly, get his meds. No sign, no sign. So I phoned my dad. I says, has he come up to see you? And he went, no, he hasn't. I think and he maybe he's just having a ride round or something silly. In the beginning, you're not too worried. But as time went on, you knew what wasn't him and he should have been home. Liz decided to go to the corner shop. She'd found out that Wesley had been in and bought sweets. Now frantic with worry, she began to search the streets looking for her son. By half past nine, that's when I started panicking. And I phoned the police. There was a young police officer coming down. He says, my son's missing. He's an epileptic. He could have fell off and banged his head. He says, oh, He's just a typical laddie, man. He's probably bumped into all his friends. I says, I've been to every one of his friends' houses. I've been down in the parks and everything. I can't find him. You go on the speaker, look out for a boy on a pink, pink and white bay. By now, the whole neighborhood was searching. It was getting really, really late. Well, after 12 o'clock, the whole of my street was out. I wasn't allowed in case was the phone. All I could do was just search everywhere, everywhere you could think. I was claiming in the allotments, I was claiming here, there and everywhere. I thought possibly he's done some daft. He could be lying somewhere injured and things like that. The police were treating Wesley as a missing child. He had to be missing 72 hours before they could release it public. And when they're doing that, people were ringing up and saying they'd seen him here and they'd seen him there. But Liz wasn't convinced by public sightings especially when Wesley's bike was found. A young lad had actually brought my son's bike back to us. Oh, well, I lost it. Totally lost it. And I was screaming at the bike, say, where the hell is my son? He wouldn't have left his bike. He loved his bike. Phoned the police up. And they went, 
I'm sure it's Wesley's bike. I went, you tell me how many boys ride around on a pink and white bike. I went, it's definitely my son's bike. His bike had been found. I, I, I knew for a the fact then something going toward it happened. Due to the numerous reported sightings of Wesley, it wasn't until three weeks after he had disappeared that the police started to think that he was more than a missing child. And DSI Trevor Fordy was drafted in. The police had fully committed resources to, to searching the west end of Newcastle for him, so it wasn't as if they held back. The problem when I took charge was that we had something upwards of a hundred sightings of Wesley. And when I talk about sightings, there were sightings by people that thought they'd seen Wesley, but more importantly, or significantly, there were sightings of people who knew Wesley. And some of them, quite a number of them, had actually said they'd spoken to him on regular occasions whilst he was missing. These were allegedly confirmed sightings. So you're not looking for a homicide, you're not looking for a suspicious death. But like Liz, it was the fact that Wesley had abandoned his bike that led Trevor to believe there was something more sinister behind his disappearance. I learned that he was actually besotted with this bicycle and very rarely let it out of his sight. So that was probably the main reason that raised my suspicions. The whole thrust was to try to find Wesley alive. But failing that, had he been abducted, to find out who was responsible for that abduction. Liz and Harry were assigned family liaison officer, Heather Carroll. You are primarily there, I believe, to care and look after the needs of that family. And you're that link between the investigating team and that family. It was very unlikely that Wesley was a runaway. He was a happy, loved, cared for little boy. It wasn't so Mr Fordy and Heather and the rest of the team took on that things started stepping up. Because of the possible abduction, we had to look at potential sex offenders. We had to look at paedophiles that might be in the area. We had to look at those people that might be on the sex offenders register. As it happened, the West End of Newcastle had a hostel where quite a number of sex offenders were living. Police identified those who were on the register, but it was a tip-off from a social worker from Northumberland about a young man housed nearby that caught Trevor's attention. He was 18-year-old music student, Dominic McKilligan. We discovered he'd been resident in an establishment for young sex offenders. I discovered he'd had a problematic family life and been arrested and prosecuted for sexual offences with children in the Bournemouth area. Originally from Bournemouth, McKilligan had been sent to a young people's centre in County Durham following his conviction for indecently assaulting four young children and had moved to Newcastle after his release in September 1997. Significantly, this date was the reason police in Newcastle had not been informed of his history. It was let out the day before the sex offenders register was introduced, therefore you'd missed it by one day. Could have made a difference and it could have brought him to the fore much earlier because the bicycle had been recovered not far from Dominic McKilligan's home address. This wasn't the only link McKilligan had to Wesley. He was actually one of the people that had put in the sighting of a boy he thought was Wesley Neely but he allegedly didn't know him. On discovering McKilligan had reported a sighting of Wesley, DSI Trevor Fordy wasted no time in arresting his prime suspect. Dominic McKilligan was unlike anybody I'd ever had dealings with before. He was confident to the point of being arrogant. He was young, he was of slight build, he was baby-faced, but he had this hard streak in him and he showed no remorse as to what had happened to Wesley Neely. It, he was almost dismissive. I'd made the decision to have the house he was living in searched. And then I got news that an officer had found a torn-up check stuck to the bottom of a waste bin. The check, when put together, was made payable to Wesley Neely. 
and signed by Dominic McKilligan. McKilligan made the excuse that he'd written out a number of cheques, signed them and left them blank, and some person had written the name Wesley Neely onto the cheque in order to incriminate him. I sent the cheques for a forensic examination. I also got a handwriting expert to look at the style of the various parts of the cheque. The results proved that it was Dominic who had written Wesley's name on the cheque. As both the ink and handwriting matched his signature, Dominic had lied to the police. Whilst his forensic tests were being carried out, Dominic McKilligan had already been released, but the police were keeping him under surveillance in order to gain more evidence. He started changing number plates on cars. He then went and purchased a number of aspirins. He also bought some razor blades. So we decided to bring him in again. We weren't sure what his intentions were, whether it was to abduct somebody else or to take his own life. We spent some time interviewing him and eventually he admitted abduction, but abduction only. However, Dominic McKilligan then said, yes, I abducted him, but I've handed him over to a group of paedophiles. And I'm not going to tell you exactly who they are, but they did phone me a day or so ago, and Wesley is still alive. For obvious reasons, the thrust of the inquiry had to change dramatically. So getting a conviction, although important, was no longer the priority. The priority was to recover Wesley alive. So we had to change tack, and we spent a couple of days looking for this group of alleged paedophiles. We identified one guy who was supposed to be involved. He was interviewed, and it was quite clear he had no involvement at all. When that was put to McKilligan, he virtually said, OK, I'll take you to where Wesley is. Was this another attempt to distract and delay the police? Or would he lead them to Wesley? He was almost bragging. Funny thing to say, but that's how he came across. I accompanied him. He drove about 20 miles west of Newcastle and came to some woodland and he said, he's down that lane. And again, no remorse, nothing. There was nothing there. I went down the lane and I found a bin liner and I saw some little shoes sticking out the bin liner. And I knew it was Wesley because I had a good description of what he was wearing when he went missing. Wesley had actually been abducted and murdered the day he'd gone missing. Wesley had been missing for a month and it was the summer, so there was quite a lot of decomposition. Despite all the reported sightings of Wesley, he had been killed on the very same day he disappeared. They are now referred to as empathetic sightings. So some people want to try to reassure family that their loved ones are still alive. Was McKilligan's apparent sighting just another part of his warped game and all the time knowing he'd killed Wesley? So unusual was Dominic McKilligan. When I came back and he saw that I was clearly upset, he actually said, is it possible to have my car back now? He didn't appreciate the seriousness of what was going on. He remained confident, he remained arrogant, as if the belief that now that he'd pointed out Wesley, he could go home. Now McKilligan was trying to get away with murder by coming up with the excuse that Wesley's death had been an accident. He said he was a car enthusiast, which clearly he was, and he'd come out and he found Wesley on the roof of his car and he shouted at him and he fell off the car and hit his head on a wrench. But then he said he was lying on the ground. He put a bin liner over his head and squeezed him, squeezed his neck. So in actual fact, he admitted killing him. With Wesley's body now recovered and his killer under arrest, the difficult job of telling the family lay ahead. When we received the news, it was absolutely heartbreaking, heartbreaking, but 
you had to be strong for the family and be able to deliver that information and and put their needs first. Mr. Ford got on his knees. He went, we are found Wesley. It's definitely Wesley because of the clothes. He went, I'm sorry, he's dead. And I can remember the screams. All you could think was his last minute on earth. I drove you nuts. Harry and Liz were desperate to see Wesley's body, but the police advised against it. If you lie in, in the elements in the summer for a month, decomposition, animals, this, that, and the other, could you... I wasn't a fool. I knew exactly that it wouldn't have been pleasant, but you couldn't say goodbye. And it tortured you. I think that's been the hardest thing for me and my dad, that we weren't allowed to say goodbye properly. We have found Mr Foley went, we've arrested a man. His name's Dominic McCulligan, and he's a known paedophile. Do you know Dominic McCulligan? And I went, no, I don't think I do. Not only did we charge Dominic McCulligan with murder, we charged him with rape. Not on the basis he admitted rape, but the pathology tended to suggest he was probably raped. If only convicted of a murder, Dominic McKilligan would again not go on the sex offenders register as the legislation stood at that time. And that was the reason why I charged rape. Dominic McKilligan was set to stand trial for Wesley's murder and rape. The first time Liz saw him in court, she made a sickening discovery. I can remember not being able to breathe. Mr Foley went, why did you stop breathing, Liz? And I went, he plays football on the school field with my son and the rest of the children. As soon as I was shouting for Wesley's for his dinner, Wesley was at the other end of the field. I said, you come over and ask me, was I Wesley's mum? And I went, yeah. I said, can you tell him, please, his dinner's ready? And he went, oh, I will do. I went, I'm telling you, it was him. After believing she'd never set eyes on Dominic before, Liz now recalled this encounter at the football field. She also made another chilling discovery about the stranger who asked Wesley for help with his car. T. Wesley told me about this man offering him to fix the car. It was the day that McKilligan wrote the check out to my son. It appeared Dominic McKilligan had known Wesley prior to the day of his murder. And despite Liz's attempt to protect her son, McKilligan had simply bided his time. The trail was terrible. You've got to sit there and you're hearing things that you don't really want to hear about. And being struck with a ratchet and strangled, and yet you've got to sit in court and you've got to keep your cool. It was a very, very stressful trial. And I certainly felt pressure that it was important that Dominic McKilligan was convicted. He looked harmless, even standing in the dock. He was like an ever school schoolboy. And you always had this doubt that the jury would turn around and say, I don't think he's guilty. Dominic McKilligan had been examined by a number of experts, and he was at the top of the spectrum in relation to being a psychopath. During the course of the trial, I took a telephone call from one of these experts who explained that should Dominic McKilligan be acquitted because he was pleading not guilty, it was imperative that he was put under surveillance because that person was convinced he would go out and do something again, which put a big onus on us if he was acquitted. It took the jury just under three hours to find Dominic McKilligan guilty of murder and rape. For murder, he was sentenced to life with a minimum of 20 years. It was nine years for the rape and life for the murder. And I was ecstatic because they got it right. Being a psychopath, he always thought he was cleverer than everybody else. And I think he convinced himself he was going to get away with it. He took it. He didn't look upset. He looked, as he always looked, very confident, very nonchalant. It didn't seem to bother him one eye or I'm sure it did, but that wasn't apparent. I actually cried, and I've never, ever done that before in court. So it was a relief. When the prison van drove away from the court, members of the public thumped the van. And we later discovered some of those people were jurors. 
McKilligan's conviction for rape now meant he would finally be on the sex offenders register, but it didn't stand for long. He appealed, and on a later date, the rape conviction was quashed. You think of decomposition and different things. Well, no doubt there was a lot of evidence lost, so they couldn't prove rape. Once again, he goes under the radar in regards to the sex register. However, he will be on license always, so there is some kind of register there. The possibility of Dominic's imminent release is now a very real prospect, as he served his minimum sentence of 20 years and has now applied for parole. You want to forget about him. He's locked up, he's gone. You just hope he rots in jail. Then all of a sudden this pops up again, it's come his parole time, and then all the worry starts again. All the feelings come back, you're reliving the whole thing again. It's awful, especially to think that there's somebody out there could possibly say, well, I think he's safe enough to let out. He's only going to be 38 years of age, still a young man, starting his life off again. I understand that if he doesn't get parole, it will be reviewed every two years. But the parole board have a responsibility to ensure that if he was still a danger to the public, he shouldn't come out. I don't think he's a sort of individual that'll change. I'm not dealing with an ordinary person, you're dealing with a monster. If you can do that as a kid and come out at 38 years of age, you're still young and he still could be a terrible threat. I don't know how many chances you should get in life. But he's had his work, as far as I'm concerned. The parole board have confirmed that the review of Dominic McGilligan has been referred to the board following standard procedures. They say as follows. The job of the parole board is to determine if someone would represent a significant risk to the public after release, once they've served the minimum term set by the courts. They go on to say that the panel will carefully look at a whole range of evidence, including details of the original offence and any evidence of behaviour change. We do that with great care, they claim, and public safety is our number one priority. Four fifty-five pm on the 6th of January 2016 and four masked men jump out of a black car on a high street in Newark, Nottinghamshire and storm into a nearby jeweller's. The armed men proceed to smash glass display cabinets and grab the precious contents within. Their bags brimming with bounty. The gang seize some final mementos before preparing to make their retreat to the awaiting getaway car. Meanwhile, at that very moment on the street outside were two off-duty policemen. We walked out of the pub as soon as we got to the pavement. We could hear a lot of commotion on the street, uh, shouting and screaming. We could see people started hiding shot from us. There was people running away. We looked at each other and started running down the middle of the road towards what was happening. I could see that there was a black Audi vehicle, and as I got closer to it, I could see the driver had a full balaclava mask on, gloves on the steering wheel, and the engine was revving. It started beeping its horn. The screaming was getting more intense, more frantic sounding. Undeterred by the masked driver, what happened next was a sheer act of bravery from the two officers. I'd arrived just as the person was bursting out of the inner door. That was the, the gunman, and he had hold of a uh, unpacking shotgun. I've taught the guy to put the gun down. I've identified myself as a police officer. This chap's then pumped the unpacking shotgun, said we bore heads off. At that point, it is our training that kicked in. We just raised our hands in the defensive posture, shouted at him to get back, and shouted at him several times to put the weapon down. He edged forward, again he raised the weapon towards us and shouted that he was going to shoot us and kill us. And at that point, the other members of the gang came out of the shop. Everything seemed to slow down at this point. The faces were masked, they were all carrying a uh, hammer, and they were waving these hammers above their heads. Faced with weapon-wielding robbers, Ian and David now had a dilemma. We were a lot bit isolated physically and personally without having any police support or police equipment. We have been overpowered by the numbers, by their level of aggression. The force is backwards out towards the curb. They obviously wanted to get to their getaway vehicle and the safest thing was to allow them to do that.
The guys with the harmers have managed to get into the back of the car. I've been pushed to one side by the people that were getting into the back of the vehicle and they swung the hammer over the top of my head. But Ian wasn't prepared to go down without a fight. As the guy with the gun attempted to get in the car, there was just an opportunity for me to grab hold of him in a sort of bear hug and try to arrange him out the car. At that point when they were all in the vehicle, the car started to speed away to make the guests away. Ian still had hold of the male with the gun. The door was open and he was dragged down the road. And I just shouted, let go. The guy with the gun, he's managed to get himself fully back into the car and I've been discarded on the pavement, really. It's the car sped away from the scene. The robbers had got away, but Ian and David's presence was still invaluable. The police in mode kicks in. There's still a crime scene to deal with. There's still members of the public who could, could have been severely injured by these guys' actions. So we've then gone back to the shop to make sure everyone was OK. They were clearly terrified at what's going on, the level of aggression that these guys have shown towards them. Thankfully, no members of the public were hurt, and that's the main outcome. But there was glass everywhere, large display cabinets had been smashed to pieces. It was a scene of devastation. It's the best way to describe what was going on. Along with the jewellery, the shop sold very expensive watches, and the gang had managed to get away with a significant haul. Despite the gang's escape, David had managed to retrieve some important information before they fled. I'd managed to get the registration number of the vehicle as it left the scene, and we recorded the information down on a piece of paper and contacted the local police. Detective Sergeant Ricky Ellis of Newark CID was called to the scene soon after the incident. I've not ever attended an armed robbery of this magnitude before. Upon arrival, there was a number of units already in place. The area had been cordoned off. Two off-duty police officers informed me what had occurred. They also told me they'd written down the registration of the getaway vehicle, which provided us with some early key evidence which we could work on. A marker was placed on this vehicle, so its whereabouts would immediately be flagged up to the police should it pass any automated number plate recognition cameras. And this wasn't the only valuable evidence. The shop had some very sophisticated CCTV, which we viewed at the scene. They provided some descriptions, colour of our offenders, number of our offenders, where they came from, where they left. There was one seemingly main offender with a pump action shotgun who seemed to be directing the three with hammers. The offenders were clearly organised, very methodical. They had done some research in relation to the premises. They knew what they were going for. They knew what they wanted to achieve and in what time scale they wanted to achieve it in. The gang's planning had paid off. They'd made away with a small fortune. High-value watches were stolen in the main, and some jewellery were stolen. Approximate value of £250,000, were approximately eighty to £100,000 worth of damage to the display cabinets and the shop premises itself. And as key witnesses to this crime, David and Ian's assistance was critical. Myself and Dave then had to go and give our statements, whilst it was still fresh in our minds. So we went down to New York Police Station, because I had a hold of the guy with the gun. My jacket was potentially going to hold some form of forensic evidence on that, so I gave the officers my jacket. The fact that I was giving them my jacket, I made sure they've given his jacket as well. They themselves are treated as evidence because they've been in contact with the offenders. We swab their hands for any future forensic work we might wish to conduct. And thanks to Dave's quick thinking in remembering the registration number, within a few hours of the crime, the getaway car had been found. The vehicle was quickly identified, abandoned in a street not too far from where the offence occurred, which led us to the conclusion that the offenders had left that vehicle and then got into other vehicles to flee the area of Newark. That vehicle was forensically recovered inside with numerous weapons, numerous laundry bags that the offenders had used during the offence to put the stolen property into, and also balaclavas and gloves consistent with the ones that were used during the offence. Police forensics were able to retrieve a fingerprint from one of the large bags that had been left in the car by the robbers. After running it through the National Fingerprint Database, it was matched to a known criminal named Tommy Walden. Tommy was tracked down and arrested. And although he gave a no-comment interview, he was identified as a getaway driver at the time of the robbery. But perhaps even more importantly, 
This vehicle had provided police with another vital lead. The vehicle was identified as being uh, seen in suspicious circumstances the night before in the Grantham area. This witness had some suspicions as to the occupants of that vehicle. We described them as Asian males. Uh, we knew from the CCTV at the shop three offenders were Asian. He identified an address that those three Asian males went into. They was having a party, uh, music and laughing and joking. We ultimately ended up obtaining a warrant to gain entry into that property. None of the offenders were at the address in Grantham when the police entered, but its contents offered some crucial clues as to their identities. It seems a crime officer conducted a forensic examination of that scene to see if we could link anybody forensically to that property. We identified beer cans, all of which were forensically examined, and we obtained a number of forensic uh, identifications from those cans. The police found fingerprints on these cans, on a candle, a takeout coffee cup, and on some bin liners. The fingerprints were matched to three known criminals. Adil Yassin, Imran Zamir, and Raju Mir. The men were arrested and identified as the hammer-wielding robbers. All three were from the West Midlands area. And it was West Midlands police who located another of the criminals involved. Two days after the offence occurred on the 8th of January, police officers found a white BMW abandoned in an alleyway. Walking out from that alleyway was a male by the name of Nathan Clark. He was dressed in a dressing gown, which was a bit unusual. 2 a.m. in the morning, he had quite a considerable amount of cash in his dressing gown pocket. Police officers searched the alleyway where the vehicle was and found a carrier bag containing stolen watches from the robbery. He was ultimately arrested for this offence. Though Nathan Clark wasn't at the scene of the robbery, he'd been clever enough to make sure he was miles away, back in the West Midlands at the time. It was discovered that he was the mastermind behind the entire enterprise. But this wasn't the end of the arrests. As the investigation continued, a further seven people were charged for their involvement in the robbery, including the gunman, John Daly. During the investigation, we quickly established we were dealing with two gangs, which had amalgamated to commit this uh, one offence. There was a West Midlands group I would describe as the doers in relation to the offence. There was the main organiser, Nathan Clark, probably the main contact between both groups. We believe he was responsible for the recruitment of the people who went into the shop. John Daly, who was the gunman, Imran Zamir, Adil Yassin and Raju Mir, who also went into the shop armed with hammers. Following on from that, there was a group identified from the Boston area in Lincolnshire, which we believe was headed by a male called Matthew Porter. He was responsible for recruiting further getaway drivers, providing vehicles for wreckies of the jewellers, providing vehicles for getaway on the scene and provided safe houses for the offenders to meet up prior to and post offence. There are a number of ways in which the police were able to identify these gang members and their roles in the crime, one of which was through looking at mobile phone data. We conducted mobile phone work to establish who was contacting who and where during relevant key dates and times. In relation to proving that link between these uh, two distinctive groups, we were assisted greatly by NPR work in relation to convoys of vehicles. Through the use of number plate recognition cameras, different members of the gang were seen travelling in convoy together to various locations. In fact, two days before the crime, Nathan Clark, head of the West Midlands group, and Matthew Porter, who headed up the Lincolnshire group, were captured travelling to Newark in convoy with Zamir, Yassin and Mir, the three hammer-wielding robbers. CCTV greatly assisted in identifying these additional culprits and the links between the two gangs. It became clear during the investigation that a number of members of the group met up the night before the offence at a local pub in Grantham. We obtained CCTV from that meeting and identified John Daly, Nathan Clark, Matthew Porter, meeting up with Tommy Walden, who was the driver of the getaway vehicle. Police analysed further CCTV from the jewellery shop recorded in the days leading up to the robbery. This showed up at least two occasions where gang members had gone to the shops for reconnaissance purposes. On the 30th of December 2015, six days before the robbery, Adil Yassin visited the shop on the premise he wanted to buy a watch for his father. After viewing a number of watches, he made an excuse and left. Then, two days prior to the robbery, 
Matthew Porter could be seen filming inside the premises with a video-style pen concealed in his pocket. He was capturing images of the shop's contents and waiting in a black Range Rover outside was Nathan Clark. But there was to be a final twist in the tale. As an incident that would seem more at home in a comedy film rather than a real-life crime, saw the arrest of two more accomplices three days after the robbery. A male contacted the shop directly and spoke to the owner's son and asked him if he wanted to purchase a Brightling watch, which was second-hand, and intimated that they may have more as well. The owner's son was alerted by the fact that they'd had a number stolen. He asked for the serial number of that watch, and uh, that was provided to him. The serial number matched one of the watches stolen during the robbery. Unbelievably, this man was attempting to sell a watch back to the shop it had been stolen from. It was beyond belief that somebody could do that. Clearly, they were aware that the shop were uh, prestige dealers of Brightlands, but unfortunately for them, failed to use the research to establish that they'd been a victim of a robbery. Once the serial number was identified, the shopkeeper contacted the police to make them aware that somebody was coming to the shop at prearranged time and date, and they would be in possession of one of the stolen watches. We made sure officers were in place to intercept that mail when he attended the shop. When it became apparent to us that Yag yeah, got the stolen watch with him, he was quickly arrested, along with his friend who was waiting outside in the car. Abdul Khalik was arrested inside the shop, whilst his associate, Shah Alam, was waiting outside in the car. I do not believe they were initially involved in the robbery. It would be clear if they were, then they wouldn't sell that watch back to that shop. Shah Alam became in possession of the stolen watch after buying it from Nathan Clark. Both men were arrested for possession of that watch. Both men were charged with conspiracy to convert stolen property. And although Shah was not said to have any direct knowledge of the robbery offence at the time of having the watches, he was seen as being a key link between Nathan Clark and the distribution of stolen watches to Abdul Khalik. This investigation was extremely fast-flowing. In total, we arrested 17 suspects. We charged 11. The key things in solving this case were, honestly, a bit of luck from witnesses who report suspicious circumstances, CCTV, mobile phones, and interpretation of data from that, and excellent forensic work. It's outstanding the work that Nottingham Police and the detectives did, not just to catch the people that committed the actual armed robbery itself, but those that were planning it, those that were organising it, and those afterwards were trying to sell the items. With 10 of the 11 gang members pleading guilty, this meant only one person went to trial. When the case finally went to court, suspects pleaded guilty to the charges brought against them, all bar Abdul Khalik, who was the male who fetched the stolen watch into the shop, who went to trial, he was found guilty by a jury. The others knew the evidence was strong, and that's why they pleaded guilty to reduce their sentence. The only thing I'm thankful of is the fact that it resulted in witnesses who were present in the shop not having to provide their evidence, as this may have been traumatic for them. The suspects had no guilt, no concerns as to what they'd done or the trauma that they'd given to the staff of that shop and the members of the public outside. Despite their guilty plea, the gang members still received significant sentences. The gang in total were sentenced to an excess of 90 years for this offence. Lengthy sentences, clearly a serious offence. Nathan Clark, described as the managing director of the gang by the judge, was sentenced to 15 years. Gunman John Daly, who directed the other offenders whilst in the shop, received 15 years and six months. The three hammer-wielding robbers, Mia, Yassin and Zamir, were each given 10 years and eight months. Tommy Walden, the masked getaway driver, who in addition was involved in some of the planning, was sentenced to 10 years and eight months. Matthew Porter, the leader of the Lincolnshire group, received a 10-year sentence. Finally, Shah Alam, who drove Abdul Khalik to the jewellers to sell them the stolen watch, got 10 months. And after going to trial, Abdul Khalik received a sentence of 12 months. To get a phone call from the investigation team after the end of the trial to tell us what had actually happened, that was phenomenal sentencing. But rightly so, because these guys were aggressive. They were violent. They were out there to cause as much devastation as they could. And the closure that gives to those members of the public who decide to witness that, those shop staff who are terrified of these guys' actions, that gives them closure. And that, that's very good.
I was extremely proud of the team involved in this investigation, and that ranged from police staff, CID teams, specific search teams, not only in Nottinghamshire, but in Lincolnshire, in West Midlands, and everybody pulling together provided a brilliant conclusion. David and Ian's part in the case was also by no means forgotten. Myself and Dave Court put forward by the Police Federation of Lincolnshire for the National Police Bravery Awards, which was a formal occasion in London, a visit to Downing Street to meet the Prime Minister, then on to the actual award ceremony itself. The time that we were taken down to London to attend Downing Street and receive the award, it was one of the best nights of my life. I certainly don't think these guys would have thought that two police officers from Lincolnshire were going to upset the party. And the police were dead. The other police were dead. Very proud that we did something on the night. The only thing I would say is we, we are both disappointed that we weren't able to catch them at the scene.